This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Yeah. And today's guest, we've got Angelica Robles. How are you? Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Um, your book, which we'll touch on in a minute, but 16 years investigator. You worked for the FBI. Your husband was part of the Mexican cartel. Pretty much story. Your book's Through My Brown Eyes. Through, Through These, these Brown, brown Eyes. eyes. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. Where can people buy the book, first of all? Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's also on Audible. So, yeah. yeah. In my own voice. I get to read it to you. Good stuff. <laughs> Listen, you've came all the way from America to be on this podcast, so I'm very grateful. No doubt we'll get into a lot of mad stuff on this story. But how are you? I'm good. I love London. It's so nice here. Yeah, How's the weather been? It's been good. good it's good. not hot. I haven't been out all day. I've been doing podcasts all day. <laughs> but like I said, 16 years investigator, working for the FBI. You've done some mad shit. Your husband's done some mad shit. You've got a book which they're turning into a Hollywood movie, which we'll touch on. But... I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. So born and raised in Chicago. I was born in an underserved community, Cicero. So if everybody knows who Al Capone is, I was raised in Cicero. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty much a Mexican hood. It's predominantly Mexican people and, you know, low income, lots of violence, like lots of gang activity, lots of drug dealing. So what were you like at school? I was very smart. I was very smart and I was very determined because my parents are immigrants from Mexico and they pretty much told us two things. You either work or you get an education. Pick one. And that's all we needed to hear. How so, were your parents? My parents, they're, so my dad is 73 and my mom is going to be 70. So they were both born in Mexico and they immigrated into the U.S. Did you have a big family? I have two sisters and one brother, so not really. Are you close? We are close. We are very close, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, did, what were you like at school? I was very popular, and people were always talking about me. So all of the crazy rumors, yeah, it was all about me. <laughs> like what? Um, you know, I went to a school where, when I went to school, we had the highest pregnancy rate in the country. So it was cool to be pregnant and everybody was pregnant and it became so common that they made classes where you can bring your kids and it would be um, child development courses, classes. I know it's crazy. It's crazy because I'm going to be 41. So you can imagine it was an environment where just kids were getting pregnant and nobody was really teaching us about sex and development. And so people were just getting pregnant. What so, age? I mean, this was like 15. So, yeah. That's fucked up. It is fucked up. I know. I talk about it in the book because it became prevalent and it was celebrated. It was celebrated. Oh, you're pregnant and you're 15. So I have friends that have like 23 year olds. Does that make you, why were you not one of the girls who then fell pregnant and tried to be the same as everyone else? I think I was involved in sports. 
And I was considered one of the smart kids. So I was in AP classes, so advanced placement classes. And we both, me and my siblings were very much, I played soccer since I was three. And so I think sports really kept us out of the streets and out of the bedrooms, you know? <laughs> yeah, literally, because we we were doing work and we were going to school. But I think what it was is we saw our parents working so hard. Our parents were never around. They were working long, long hours. So we raised ourselves. And I think seeing that and seeing how hard our parents worked, we weren't going to get into any shit. Mm -hmm. So what did you do after school? I went to college. I went and got a four year degree. I actually was a sophomore in college when I graduated high school. That's how smart I was. Mm -hmm. So I was just taking all these courses. When I was in high school, I was taking college courses. So I went to college and I didn't do any other crazy partying and the drugs and all this because I knew that the government was going to investigate me and they were able to uncover all this shit that we do in, in college. And so I was a goody two shoes in college, was working the jobs, was doing the 911 calls. You know, I was building up my resume so that I looked perfect for the government whenever I went to go apply. So, so how was that then? How were they looking into you then? Well, they do a background investigation, a thorough background investigation. And then when they polygraph you, they ask you everything and anything. So ev anything is fair game. So when you go, to, what did you study at college? I studied forensic psychology and chemistry. So is that for to go into the government? You just need to have a bachelor's to, to apply for FBI, CIA, DEA. That's one of the requirements. You have to have a college education. And that was the route you wanted to go down? Straight away. Yeah, I, I knew that I wanted to work <clears throat> for the government after one of my friends was murdered. Uh, that really kind of catapulted me into working for the government and wanting to do what I did. When I was 15 years old, I was dating a boy and his sister was murdered, dismembered and decapitated by the cartel. And so she went missing for two weeks. And when they found her, they found her head and it was completely decayed. And the only reason why we were able to identify her was because she was wearing braces by dental records. It ended up being one of Chicago's most heinous crimes in history. The way that he killed her, she went on a first date. And can you imagine going on a first date and then getting murdered? She went on a first date with a guy she'd never met and the cartel was after him. And because she was with him, they took her out as well. And if you read the transcripts of the crime, I reread it probably about three years ago before my book came out because I had never really sat down and listened to the entire testimony of, of the um, killer. And the things that he did to them is satanic. I mean, I don't know how somebody can do this to somebody. I mean, he chopped them up with samurai swords, hung them upside down in his bathtub, drained their blood and, and chopped them up into pieces and then distributed the pieces all over in different parts of Chicago to show we, you don't fuck with us, pretty much. So I think they, they found his leg in the Chicago River. Her head was in the north side. Some of her legs were in the south side. And it was pretty much saying, you owed us money, so this is how we're getting you back. Was that frequent in Chicago, this sort of stuff? Yes, it's very frequent, but it doesn't make the media because it happens so often. You know, there's so many shootings and killings in Chicago. They, they've been, they've called it Chirac because it's more people are getting killed in Chicago than in war. But the cartel is heavy in, cartel and mafia is very heavy in Chicago. It always has been. And I think when you're involved in that world, you, you know that it's happening, but the media is not going to be reporting every time they find a dead body. But I think this one was huge because the family was relentless in trying to find her. And so it, it became a, a, a big deal. And I mean, at the time I was 15. So imagine being 15 and trying to deal with this and trying to process all this. It's, it's a lot. What happened when you found out that she was found dead? Um, I felt like I got hit by a train and I felt... Like, I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to process it. I grew up in a neighborhood where people were getting killed and there was blood on the steps of people's homes. But when it was somebody that you knew, it felt totally different. And especially when you grew up in an, in, in an environment where things like this happen and people expect you to just move on and get over it and really not process it. 
So I felt dead inside, to be honest with you. And I was scared. I was frightened and I was scared that somebody can do this to some other person. So that's why you wanted to kind of join. Yeah, I wanted to join the government because I wanted to know how and why somebody like this, what causes somebody to want to take somebody's life in this manner and just act normal. Like that's not normal. That's psychopath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of them around. Yeah. I had a man on who was CIA. Yeah. But he says, I don't know if he says you can't join the CIA, but he says that the recruit, because they'll look at people's college results, they'll look at people that's in prison, like pickpockets or whatever, and they'll look at other people's college results to say, okay, they're 100%, we'll bring them in. So they were recruiting by people's results at school, picking yeah. the best, yeah. picking the best pop, pop, like shoplifter to teach other agents how to do it like it's mad the organization and how deep and dark it can go as well yeah so how long did you stay in college for how does a college program work it's four years in college in the mm. u.s uh i only did three years because i was already i already had college credit going into school and then to join any agency in the u.s you have to be 23 years old so i was 21 when i graduated and i went and did criminal counseling and that's really when i started getting exposed to what we call unfit to stand trial. So somebody who is unfit to stand trial due to insanity. So this person cannot stand in trial because they're crazy. So instead of going to jail, they put them in a federal psych ward pretty much. And they have these people pretty much zombied out on, some, uh, on so much medication because I used to talk to them. So my job right out of college was I was doing case management for those who are unfit to stand trial. So pretty much insane people, where you go in and you talk to them and you try to get more information of their childhood, who they are, what really got them to do what they did. I remember my first murder, he had set his boss on fire. He set his boss on fire and then pushed him off of a balcony of a building. So can you imagine this man on fire falling down from a building? And this man just did it on purpose because he fired him. He fired him. So he fired him. Yeah, pretty That's, much. How long did you do that for? I did that for about a year and a half. And then that's when I went in and I started doing undercover work. How so I got thrown into undercover work. Yeah, very young. How old? I started undercover at 23. Young is very young. Yeah. Eh? Um, so see when you're doing the interviewing, I interview criminals, but not as, as crazy as those people, so I've interviewed a lot of people who've done some bad shit, but how, see when you interviewing your very first one, were you nervous or were you excited? I was very nervous, but I was taught that in order to speak to somebody who goes against your morals and ethics, you have to literally disassociate yourself from emotion and just listen, right? And it's hard because you as an individual, you have a lot of judgment. And that's one of the things that I've learned is judgment goes deep because we are born with such principles and we are taught such principles, what's right from wrong. But when you're sitting in front of somebody and they're telling you how they killed somebody or why they killed somebody, you really have to stay unbiased and just listen. And I remember the first time I had that conversation with him, I told myself murderers need hugs too, because I was listening to the child in him talk about how his father raped him and how his father beat him. And I, I had compassion for him because due to this childhood trauma that he had, it turned left where he now became a killer and he just did not have any emotion. Because everybody who I interview, every criminal, every bad man I've interviewed, 100% of the time, every single one has been bullied or abused when they're younger. Did you see this also? Yes, that's the that's the number <clears throat> one trait of psychopaths, sociopaths, murderers, killers, drug dealers, terrorists, the whole nine. I've interviewed the scum of the earth, name it. People who kill children, people who eat people, people who terrorize and, you know, Iraqis, Pakistanians, you know, pretty much terrorist members who take other lives. A hundred percent of them always had some childhood trauma. I mean, it's like Jeffrey Dahmer. And all this other stuff, you know, it's, it, it develops into this addiction or almost into an addiction and an obsession with whatever it may be. So was is that a tactic to send a young, good looking girl in to then 
interview these men because they open up yes. more? Is there any yes. is there sort any sort of flirting? There, yes, definitely. So when I walk in, of course they see me and they think I'm like the social worker, right? They don't think I'm the actual interrogator. And I never, I, I never yell at people. That was never my tactic. My tactic is I'm always very nice. I'm always very, I've been told that I have this energy where you're comfortable and you just open up. I'll be at the grocery store and people just open up to me and I'm like, I don't want to know your life story. <laughs> but I think it's that energy that I was taught to have. And so they start fixing their hair. And in that moment, it's like two, three seconds, your brain puts his defenses down. And then that's when I go in and start asking questions. And then they realize, oh, wait, I'm telling too much. And now I'm self-incriminating myself because they put their guard down. But you ever scared? Yeah, I was scared. I talk about it in the book. There was one guy who attacked me. We were sitting like this, like you and I are. And I don't think he took his medication that morning because he was too too perky. Like he was too bright eyed. And as we were talking, he shoots across the table, grabs my neck. We both fall back. And I can feel his breath and his teeth grinding in my face. He was trying to strangle me. But in that moment, we get uh, we get these little devices where if we need assistance, we press on them. So I was able to grab it and press it. And then security came in. But he was going to kill me. Did you ever feel sorry for anyone? Yeah, all the time. <clears throat> I mean, I feel sorry for all of them because they have this representation or this understanding that who they are is to kill. It, it's it's almost like they're they're lost. Their their mind is lost. That there's no coming back. Did you ever have anyone try to trick you, as if they were crazy just to get a smaller sentence or a, an easier prison? Yes. So f with terrorists, a lot of people don't realize this. With terrorists and drug dealers, especially coming from the U.S., they all want one thing. They all want anonymity, and they all want a U.S. citizenship. They want to stay in the U.S. They never want to be extradited back to their home countries. And that's what blew my mind. When uh, two years ago, three years ago, post uh, or right before pandemic, I was doing Somalian terrorists in California. They were bringing the Somalian terrorists, you know, like pirates. They were bringing them to, to the federal penitentiaries in California. And I was talking to them and I was like, why? Why do you guys take stuff? And he's like, because we don't have anything. So for us to take is for us to have something. And it blew my mind that taking lives and killing people just to feel a need to have something is why they were terrorizing the boats. Mm -hmm. So, Who's the scariest one you interviewed? I want to say my husband because I was sleeping and married to somebody for 10 years and I didn't even know that he had been involved with the enemy. So I would say that's probably the scariest because that's when it humbled me that I'm considered one of the best uh, interrogators in the world. And I didn't even know I was literally sleeping next to the enemy, like literally. And that's scary because that just shows how I was so lost in my marriage and so lost in trying to raise our children that I didn't even realize he was involved that's probably the scariest. The world's full of crazy bastards. Like, there is genuine. Britain, it's more murders. It's more shootings. It's not really gang-orientated. It's drug-related. or But Americans seem to have proper, like, psychopaths, um, serial killers. Why do you think that is? I think it all goes back to childhood and environment, how they were raised and who raised them and what they dealt with. It, it always has to be that. When you, when you hear about serial killers that are sociopaths, these are regular individuals who hold regular jobs, who are very loving fathers or corporation heads, but then they have this dark side where they're doing all this other shit in the background. But just like uh, your last guest was talking about, human trafficking is huge in the U.S. It's a huge market and it's almost surpassing drug dealing because of vices and addictions. There's a lot of people that like to have sex with children. Why do you think that is? Do you think that's always been here in the world, but it's just now you hear more of it? Or do you think there's something not quite right that people are going down that route, satanic and doing weird shit and drinking blood and f abusing kids and killing kids and harvesting organs? Yeah. But what the, like, I don't know the facts and stats, but... 
there's something not right. It seems to yeah. be getting fucking worse. It is worse. And I'll tell you, uh, it got worse during the pandemic because it's all addiction. We uh, People have addictions. It could be drugs, sex, alcohol, children. And, you know, cocaine stimulates the U.S. economy. As much as people like to say that the DEA is this war against drugs, it's the same people that are involved in the government that are allowing this drug to come into the U.S. Same thing with children. The situation in Mexico and Central America has gotten so bad with the economy as well as the government climate that what's happening now is families are selling their children for money. So these kids are being sold to, to the system of human trafficking for money, for survival. And a lot of people think that it's immigrant children, but it's actually not. It's, it is a lot of immigrant children, but it's also just regular American children that get caught into this world. Did you ever cry interrogating any of these men? No, never. I would cry afterwards, but never during. Because uh, yeah, that, that would be that would be hell. After hearing the stories? After hearing the stories, yes. Like whenever you go home, and this was probably in the beginning when I was starting to to grow into my own interrogation skills. Yeah, I had to detach who I was in the interrogation room to who I am in, in real life. And I tell this story all the time when my husband was ready to tell me his story. I had to separate wife from the interrogator in me. And as much as I wanted to kill him, because I, I, I literally reached for my gun to kill him, in a split second, I thought, do what you do best and separate wife from the situation and interrogate him. What's the worst stories you had to hear? The killing of children. I think that's, as a mother, I think that's the worst. You know, I have two kids, a seven and a five-year-old, but for somebody to just be killing kids and enjoying it, that's probably the worst because a child is so pure and a child can't defend himself. And when you have an addiction to killing and raping children, you're really fucked up. I mean, that's the worst that you can possibly get. Do you see, because you see all these predators on TV, you just know he's, he's a fucking weirdo him. And yeah. sometimes, listen, you can be wrong, but you get that vibe. You just think... He's a creepy bastard. Yep. Did you know, or was, it, or was it totally different when you thought, nah, he, he could pass as someone normal? Or did you feel that coldness or the vibe where something was amiss? I always feel that. I can be at the grocery store and I can feel that. Yeah. But I've been doing this for so long that I can just read people and they don't even have to say anything. Mm -hmm. I can tell when someone is lying. I can tell when somebody is nervous. I can tell when somebody is hiding something. So I could just be sitting at the grocery store and just observing people by body language. And, and I'm like, yeah, that, that guy probably has dead bodies under his house. <laughs> because they just, they're disconnected yeah. emotionally from reality, if that makes sense. And they're floating in this life, but they have just this other vice that kind of fuels them. You know, and I've told this to people when I interviewed killers, I ask them, what do they feel? And they say exhilaration. It's almost like being high on drugs. When they kill somebody and look into their eyes and see their life being taken away, it's almost like a hit for them. Yeah. It's crazy. Do you, when did you realize a change in you? Because the amount of people I interview now, I wouldn't say, I've just been more wary of the world who my kids are around and became more protective. Did you see a change in you? Did you become more cold to the world? Yeah, I definitely did. I would say, so I did two years of undercover work and I was taken and I had guns to my head and all that did happen, <clears throat> which we'll go into more detail in the movie because I left, I left it kind of vague in the book strategically for movie purposes. But I started realizing nobody gives a fuck about you. And your life is meaningless. You're the only one that puts meaning on your life. Maybe you or your mother. But these people, they don't care. They kill people like they're swatting flies. And so I had to grow thick skin. And I had to understand that there's no way to get emotionally involved in any way, shape, or form. You literally have to just be numb. That's what, the only way to describe it. What was your tactics going in and speaking to people? Did you have a game plan or did you just wing it where... You, you kind of knew what you were doing, but it's yeah. just robotic. So what I learned was comfort. People start opening up based on their comfort level. 
So once they feel comfortable, they start opening up. But my tactic was to connect with them. So most of the guys that I was talking to were Mexican drug dealers or of Mexican descent. So I lived in Mexico for five years. So starting the conversation off in Spanish, it's like they were already comforted, like, oh, she speaks Spanish and oh, she's really pretty. Oh, I think she's a social worker. So everybody thought I was a social worker that was there to mentally help them, but they didn't realize I was actually there to get information out. Was there anybody who was wary of you and closed off? Yeah, there's always been some. Um, there was one gentleman I remember that I did bang the table. That was the only time that I got upset and banged the table. And it was because he was just doing the runaround where he says, yes, I know. Yes, I don't know. And, and you're like, well, what is it? Is it yes or no? And that was probably one difficult person that I can remember. And it was a Somalian terrorist. What did you do after the interrogation stuff? So after the interrogation stuff, I went and worked for a communication company called Equilibria. It's a global communication company. And it's pretty much learning how to communicate and teaching corporations how to communicate. And during the pandemic, I was on a podcast with another uh, London guy, Mark Wilkinson. And I was approached to write my book because I spoke about my undercover work during the pandemic and how everything was going on. And so I wrote my book and I lost my contracts because nobody was flying and all of my contracts were uh, flying based. I didn't do any work in Houston. I was flying to California, to the federal penitentiaries to go interrogate different terrorists and criminals and drug dealers. And I wanted it that way because I didn't want to be working in Houston where it's too close for comfort. So when I wrote my book, that's when my ex, my husband at the time, wanted to read the transcript before I went to editing. And the crazy part is I was actually working for the DEA when I wrote my book. I had gotten a little side hustle with the DEA and I was uh, supervising the wire room. So, you know, the wire room is uh, all the undercover <clears throat> agents that wear wires. You, I was sitting in the room listening to all those wires. And so when I came home, it, I had worked the night shift. And then that's when my husband said, hey, I need to talk to you. And I said, well, what is it? What can it wait? And he's like, no, it can't wait. And then that's when he told me that him and his family had been part of the Mexican cartel. Where did you meet your husband? I met him on a dating app. But the crazy thing is, is he had his life so well put together. And there's a whole nother backstory that will be talked about in book two but so he's a commercial real estate broker so what he does and he's a vice president so he has a very high position but who do you think is buying buildings in houston yeah drug lords. the cartel members are yeah. buying buildings so he's involved in those transactions and so he grew up in the cartel he was like an ozark child so he he what's that so ozark is like a drug lord show in the u.s mm -hmm. and the reason why I mentioned Ozark is because in the in the Netflix series of Ozark, the children grow up in the cartel. So when you grow up in the cartel, this becomes a norm for you. And that was the only way that I can have compassion for him because I grew up in a neighborhood where people were being shot. So hearing gunshots to me was normal. So him seeing drugs and lots of money was a normal for him because he grew up in that environment. But that's the only way I was able to have compassion to the child in him because of what I had done for a living. So it was almost, almost, and this sounds crazy. And I always say this, I feel like my job prepared me for what he did to me because now I was sitting with somebody I was married to and I was asking the same exact questions that I was asking all my drug dealers or all my drug lords because he was not part of, of that bunch. What was he like at the start? Was he smooth? No, he was a dork. <laughs> he was a total dork. Like he was a total dork and he was, you know, awkward. Could and that have been a manipulation tactic though because he knew who you were? Did you, obviously, did you, what did you tell him your job was? He knew. He knew that I was an agent. Could that have been then, could you have become a target? Yes. And I'll tell you this, and this will be in the movie and is in the book. The day we got married, 
I overheard a conversation between him and his father. And his father, who is a millionaire, did not give us any money for our wedding. So that was flag number one. He hated me. We never got along. He said to him, don't marry her. She's going to fuck us over. I tried to call the wedding off. I legit tried to call the wedding off. And my best friend said, no, he's perfect for you. Look at this wedding. Look at all these people. So I went through with it. But that was my gut instinct telling me, do not marry this man. But for an investigator, how does that then fly under the radar? You must have come in to question that you were working with the Mexican cartel also. Because for me, looking at the outside, and I'm not fucking FBI, I'd be thinking she's involved. Yes. So that's what happened. So when he told me, he talked to me for about two hours. I was able to stay calm, cool, and collected for those two hours. And I gave him that space for him to be completely honest and transparent. And I tell people, this was the most honest and transparent my husband had ever been in the 10 years we were married at this moment. After he told me, I said to him, you realize I have to report this? And he said, yes. The reason why I had to report this for those out there that are going to say she's not a ride or die, I was part of the government and I gave an oath to the government. So when I reported it, I went under federal investigation for seven weeks. I was then now on the other side of the interrogation table, a world-class interrogator now on the other side. And I'm sitting there like, you're really going to ask me that? Because I was a professional. And I got polygraphed. And the investigation went on for seven weeks. They went through my phones. They went through my emails. They went through everything, make sure I wasn't involved. And they found out I was not involved. I literally had no idea. What's that like to choose government work over family? Was it easy because you were broken by it? Or were you think that was it a one where you thought I had to think because you know yourself, family's family, you're with the guy for 10 years, doesn't matter what he done. Yeah. Like you say, ride or die. Yeah. My family I kill for. No problem. Yeah. And you know, as a mother, the lioness in me came out and I was like, wow, not only did you fuck me over, but you fucked your kids over. Because for a man to not protect and provide for his family, to me, is not a man. And, and I say this and I say this here because I've heard how you feel about how a man needs to show up for his family. But for somebody, I felt like he was that fucked up and lost in the sauce for him not to think that this was going to come out at some point. His children have to find out what he did at some point. Right now, they're too young to understand. But I started thinking about my kids. I, I literally was like, fuck you in this 10 years. It's okay that you fucked me over. But the children, because now the kids have to deal with this. And now the kids have to grow up knowing that you did this. And so it was very difficult. It was very difficult. But that mother instinct just comes up and you're just ready to fight. But... The crazy thing about it is the government told me you have two options. You lose your entire career or you, you have to disassociate yourself from him and divorce him as soon as possible. It was the fastest divorce in like Texas history because I divorced that man. I took the children. We were living this lavish lifestyle. I took the children and I left. But before I left, I told him, I'm not going to take any of your money because he had thousands of dollars that he was hiding from me in offshore accounts. I mean, this whole houses and businesses, all types of stuff that I wasn't aware of. But I was very smart. And I said, I'm not going to take anything, but I need you to sign this authorization. And he said, the authorization was him giving me permission to write everything that he had told me about his childhood and his family in my book. And he says, oh, your stupid little book? Yeah, I'll sign it. So he signs it. And I leave. And he's now left in this big house with no kids and no family. He didn't think that the book was going to do as well as it did. Well, the book hits bestseller. And then now the book got picked up for a Hollywood movie. And his family tried to come back and sue me for all the, the success of the book and now the movie. And I said, well, look at what he signed. Why did they tell you? You know, till this day, I still ask that question. And I think it it boils down to selfishness. I think he wanted the girl and he didn't care that I was an agent or worked for the government and he was selfish. But you know, cartel members are selfish. They don't care about anybody else but themselves. And I really think he thought that he was gonna get away with it. But the crazy part is, if the book did anything, 
it did to my own household because me telling my story of trauma caused him to want to tell his story. It was the book who triggered him to tell me. And I remember his mother saying, why did you tell her? She could have gone another 10 years without knowing. But I guess his conscience just ate away at him so much that he needed to tell his truth. How deep was he in the cartel? Are you talking about shipping drugs or are you just talking about him buying properties with? No, it, it was deep. So in the book, I do talk about um, his uncle was moving a million dollars worth of cocaine from Texas to Boston. And his uncle was murdered, dismembered, and decapitated, just like my friend, and lost a million dollars worth of cocaine. So a mil if you're moving a million dollars worth of cocaine, you're not a very you're not involved with, you know, small dealings. That's a lot of money and a lot of cocaine. So they pretty much kidnapped him, took all the winnings and the money and uh, and dumped his body. When did you go undercover? I went undercover in 2004, 2004, like 2005 to 2007. And what's that for? Just it was it was for corporate fraud and cartel members. So I I did old school surveillance. Surveillance now is done through our phones. I can follow you. I know where you're at. I know what yeah. you're eating. Now I know everything. But I did old school surveillance where I was in the van with the camera watching you from the bushes. That's when I did surveillance, there was no iPhones. The the most technology that we had was pinging your phone. But you know, phones are analog. They weren't digital yet. Because the first iPhone didn't come out to like 06. So mm -hmm. I did old school surveillance where I'm like in the bushes with the camera. What would you have done if you were going undercover, trying to catch cartels and you seen your husband? Would that have been weird? Or that would have been yeah. more heartbreaking because he would have That would have been more heartbreaking, yeah. But the crazy part is, and that I tried to stress, and you know, in Texas, they don't like me talking about the cartel because Houston is 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 a huge funnel for cartel. The cartel activity in Houston is huge. I mean, think about it. My husband grew up in Houston and his family was part of the cartel. But the crazy thing is there was only one agency that knew about it. And it was the DEA. Department of Defense didn't know. FBI didn't know. Nobody knew. Because what people don't realize is in, this, in the States, the agencies don't work together. They hate each other. So the DEA still hired me to work in their wire room and they were aware that my ex and his father were involved in the cartel. That's how fucked up it was. They still hired me. And we're like, oh, let's give her a little job, even though she doesn't know. So the 16 years you've done it, you interrogating the world's worst people to then undercover. What did you do after that? And how, how does it all work to get into the FBI and the government? What, what sort of other hurdles do you need to jump over? So... I did get, so, okay, so when I left, so when all this came out, I decided to still publish my book. At the time, my top secret clearance was with Department of Defense. I was a contractor with Department of Defense when all this went down. What's a contractor to them? So it? a contractor is, you're a contract agent, right? So you don't belong to the government, but you still do work for them. Like freelance? Like freelance, yes. If, mm -hmm. if you can, yeah. So I still work for the government. I work for Department of Homeland Security now, and I still do interrogations for drug dealers, but on a contract basis. I'll do like one or two high-risk cases, which is not really known knowledge, but I'm pretty much saying it in the second book because Department of Defense blacklisted me. So I, for, for people on this side of the earth, I, I don't know if you guys know what blacklist means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got blacklisted by Department of Defense for publishing the book because I decided to still go move forward and publish the book. Mm -hmm. So I get pub so I get blacklisted, lose my entire career, and then my book hits bestseller and I'm literally living off of book sales. And then a year later I get signed with Hollywood to make the book into a movie. So, so, so you're still working for the government now? Yeah. So, I work for Department of Homeland Security. And when did you join the FBI? So I joined, uh, I was undercover 2005. And then 2013, I left full-time work and I started doing contract work in so, 2013. So what start, So you were in the FBI then? No, I left 2013. And what, no, so in 2005, 
You were at FBI? Yeah, undercover. For how long? So undercover for two years, and then I was interrogating until 2013. So you've been interrogating? Forever, since I was 23. I'll be 41 in two months. Do you get to speak to someone who have been doing it so long to talk about the shit that you've heard and the shit that you're trying to interact with and that energy is with these evil people? Do you get to speak to a psychologist or make sure yeah. they're help? Yeah, we do. If we needed it, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, therapy has been really a lifesaver for me. I think I went into therapy um, after my friend got murdered because that was very difficult to deal with. How does that make you feel? You're interrogating these people who have murdered young girls as well. Does that bring back the emotion of your friend? It definitely does. But I felt, you know, I went into this field and I tell this to people, we choose our careers based on our pain. And I feel like I chose my career based on my pain because I wanted to understand how somebody can do something to another human being. And you just don't go and work for the government just because you see a movie and you think it's cool. You go through some shit mm -hmm. for anybody to go work for the CIA, FBI, DEA. It's not as fun as the movies make it seem. In fact, it's very dangerous and, and a lot of undercover people don't make it. Yeah, it's not like James Bond. It's all no. glorious. They're drinking fucking It's French never martinis like that. And it's no. South of France. It's and never like <clears throat> that. We're never driving Lambos. We're no, we're in the shadows. We're, we're in the slums. We're hiding in the darkness. There's no way we're driving Lambos. The cartel doesn't even drive Lambos, you know? They're driving like beat down Toyotas. Mm -hmm. Do you become a target when you're interrogating these people and people find out that you're not a social worker, that sweet girl just trying to... I I don't think I become a target. I get this question a lot. I don't think I become a target because most of these people are already incarcerated. They're already uh, in the process of getting indicted. And I'm not the one that makes any of these big choices, whether they're going to get, you know, indicted or whether I just, I just collect evidence and I collect information and give it to the people. So if anything, I think the cartel was laughing behind my back and saying like, look at her. She's been working for the government for so long, talking to us members for years and years and years. And here we are, we knew of her family. She didn't even know. And I always tell this to people, a cartel wife may not know everything, but she is aware that their husband is involved with the cartel. I wasn't aware at all. Because you're getting in there every day. You have seen the energy change because the cartel would have been coming in, known who you were because of your husband. Did you not, or were you just thinking they were smarter than everyone else? Or did you notice, why the fuck are they not opening up as much as everybody else? Did you question that or were you just so... I did, I did question that. And I think there's very different levels in the cartel. I think people don't realize that white collar crime is cartel. You know, uh, money laundering, embezzling, that's, that's a lot of money that's being moved around and laundered. And it's usually corporate America is involved, business owners, big business owners. I think people think that cartel is just moving drugs back and forth in, through, through the borders. But there, it's, it's a whole business empire that where money needs to be hidden and money needs to be laundered. And I don't think they realize that, you know, cartel is white collar crime. And so for a businessman like my ex-husband, it became very simple because when they're buying buildings in Houston, you know, you go out and celebrate. It's like Wolf on Wall Street. Everybody goes out and celebrates. They do coke. They go to strip club. It, it's a big celebration because it's a lot of money being involved. And it's crazy because people think that it's just like drugs that are being moved across the border. I'm like, it's a whole empire mm -hmm. that's connected with human trafficking and business and the government. And even our own government is corrupt because how do you think these tons and tons of cocaine is getting across the border? You know, that's a whole different operation in itself. Yeah. I believe everybody's got a killer in them. Everybody can kill no matter who it is. Oh yeah. The woman, the man, everybody's got that button where oh yeah if they need to i believe everybody has got that potential for sure did you see innocent not innocent people but did you see people who were sort of weak looking who then just fucking snapped and, yeah and i mean look at chapo yeah like when we see this man you see him i think he's like five eight <laughs> big beer belly i mean the guy looks harmless but he was running this whole empire 
And I remember, I this is how crazy it was. I was in the DEA elevator with the DEA Houston director when his phone rang. I was in the I was in the elevator with him when he said, "Oh, we have Chapo," and he was being extradited to Houston. Yeah, I mean, That's how crazy I was involved with the DEA. He escaped. El he escaped Chapo so many times all the time. as well. Is that because the money he had, he was paying people off? Yeah, of course. Yeah. How big was El Chapo? Was he bigger than Escobar? I think they're about the same. I mean, when there's money and drugs involved, and once you've killed, killing becomes easy for you. People say, I will ask uh, El Chapo with my hat on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuckers. Um, but so, see, when, what's it, like, when you see the serial killers and the dark stuff that people are doing, does it make you more paranoid outside of prisons and stuff does it, does it make you question everything and be more wary of how dark the world can be no like nothing surprises me now i've seen it all i've heard it all you know the, the things that people are doing to get organs that's another huge industry that people don't realize is people get you know put to sleep and you wake up and you're missing a kidney because that's another big industry is the organs and the selling of organs that's huge how big is the harvest organs? They harvest or? organs or they just they, they just mug you and take your, your organs. How big you, is that in America? It's pretty bad. It's huge. It, it's a whole nother... And it's all interconnected with drugs and the human trafficking. The human trafficking is children trafficking. Let's not get that twisted. And it's number one in Houston. That's how I ended up in Houston. I got transferred to Houston in 2008 from Chicago. So I stopped doing undercover work and I started doing human trafficking in Houston, which I didn't even realize it was a thing. I didn't even think human trafficking was alive and well in Houston. And it's huge. How bad is it actually for people who don't understand it? How bad is it? It's really it? bad. So just to get an idea, you can go to a bar in the hood in, in Houston and they take you to the back and there's little girls and little boys against the wall. And these drunk men come in and they're like, which one you want? And they're like, I'll take that one. And then they just take them to the back and, and rape them. And then the little kid goes back to the wall. It's bad. And if you look up at the stats, it's we have a lot of things that go down in Houston. But obviously people don't realize that these cases need to be worked on for years at a time because there's evidence that needs to be collected in order in, in order to indict them the most or as many people as possible. It's not just like, hey, something's going on. Let's go save these kids. It has to be done strategically. But the most trafficked child age is 11 because an 11 year old is not a little kid and it's not developed enough. So it still falls within like a child. Do you have many rogue agents who work? Yeah. With cartels and getting paid off? For sure. Yeah. yeah. Is there many? There's a lot. I mean, I was working in the wire room in Houston. And the wire room, <clears throat> you're there 24 hours. There's, It's always manned. You, you cannot leave the wire room unattended. Somebody's always listening in on calls. And it's crazy because it becomes a story. You're sitting there listening to this guy and that guy. And then you start growing emotions for somebody. And then they get killed. And you're like, oh, that guy's gone. And you're literally writing down, okay, so-and-so's dead. Now who else is going in? So when did you decide to write the book through these brown eyes? When did it come out? Yeah, when did you, what was the meaning behind writing it? So through these brown eyes is pretty much my life story through my, through my eyes, told in my mm -hmm. own words. And it just starts with childhood trauma and why I went to go work for the government and then just trauma after trauma after trauma and how I was able to turn trauma into resilience, including the book was already written and then all this unraveled because of the book, which ended up being the end of the book. Me finding out that my husband had been part of the Mexican cartel, which was a hell of a story because that's what Hollywood wanted. It, you can't make this shit up. Like you really can't make, even if you tried to, like this was really my life. How many times did they give you the polygraph test? Oh, wow. So I get polygraphed every five years. So my first one was at 23. So do the math, probably like five or six times. So what did they ask you? They asked me, was I involved? Did you know about it? Were you hiding it? 
you know, were you stealing secrets? Because ultimately they, tr they treated me like the drug dealer because I was the one who had given the oath to the government, not him. They didn't care. But here's the crazy story. The government didn't care about them. They came after me because I, I would have the bigger crime. If I was involved, I would be sitting in federal prison next to Chapel for probably life in prison. So you wrote the book, <clears throat> you gave it to your husband. Were you in love or did you have a good relationship? Was it normal? Our relationship was not normal. I tried to leave a year in because he did a 180 on me. I think he did everything nice and great. And then once we signed the papers, he totally switched on me. And he said, no more parties. Because I used to, we used to entertain and have dinner and have our friends over. We moved to the suburbs. We moved. He almost tried to isolate me. And I, I had children for six years. I was having babies. So as long as I was having children, he had control over me because I had to care for the kids, obviously. But I think during the pandemic, we were stuck at home and a lot of stuff started coming out to the surface. A lot of the things that he was hiding, money-wise, property-wise, um, LLC-wise, he had some businesses and I just started noticing some things coming in the mail because I was home all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think our, our relationship started to deteriorate because there was obviously trust issues and there was obviously a lot of things he was hiding. And I think he almost needed the book. The book is what set him off when he read all of my trauma, I think he felt sorry for me and was like, oh my God, I need to tell her this. And can you imagine holding this secret for 10 years from your wife and your family, but your family knowing and then having, and then revealing it? I, I, I tell myself, he must have felt so light by releasing all that energy that he was hiding for 10 years. It's a lot. How much did I feel, did you feel? by kind of kind of strong women trying to make a living, coming over all your trauma and pain. You're married, it's not the best relationship, but you've got kids, so you're trying to make it work, to then finding out that he's a fraud, basically. Yeah. It's probably the worst feeling in this world. It, it really is. The way I described it was getting hit by a train and realizing you're still alive and peeling yourself off the tracks. That's how I describe it. Could you become a target then by knowing this information? I think so. But I think I have, I think there's some more interesting aspects of how their involvement were because he wasn't afraid of me reporting it. So I think that the dad, and, and I'll go into it in, in book two, but I do think the dad became part of witness protection program because the dad was living in Honduras for 10 years. The 10 years we were married, he was living in the in the jungles of Honduras. And that's usually when you go into a witness protection program, you go to this offshore location. His dad was a snitch? I think so. And um, <clears throat> is that why he was scared of you then? I think so. And I also think that his father was telling him, out of all the women that you could pick, why would you pick this one? You know, and... I do believe the dad got out of his dealings. However, I don't know if it was witness protection program or what it was, but what my ex-husband told me was whenever his uncle died and they lost that, when he lost that million dollars, there was a shift. And I think that that was a shift. What happened to your husband? Nothing happened to my husband. He just grew up in the cartel, but his uncle was murdered. Did they get investigated? I have no idea. I don't think so. I think the dad became part of witness protection program, gave some up, some information up. The dad went to live outside of the country and they kept all these millions of dollars because they own a lot of land in West Texas. How do you own all this land, 1,400 acres of land working with a vending company business? But that's how they were they were law money laundering is through the vending company business because it's a cash flowing business. How did, does the dad ever see the kids now? I think, I think the DEA knows, but they're just not going to talk. And the D, the uh, Department of Defense, whenever they investigated me, 
they weren't going to try to get information because all they needed to know was that I wasn't involved. So once I was cleared, I was cleared. How was that feeling? I mean, I knew I wasn't involved, right? Because I was shocked. I mean, they could they could tap all my calls and me on the ground crying, telling my best friend, oh my God, why did I marry this fucker? You know, so it, it I was shocked. And I think the Pentagon was shocked. Department of Defense was even more shocked because when I called my boss, she must have been so silent in that phone because she didn't even know what to say. She's like, how did this fucking happen? Like, I get investigated every five years by the government because you need to be investigated every five years to have a top secret clearance. And nobody saw this. Nobody knew of this. So that's when I was like, somebody had to know. So much so that I still got cleared to go work for the DEA. That's what blows my mind. Were you nervous when the book came out? I was. How much clearance do you have to get for that, especially if you're working for the government? A top secret clearance. So top secret is, is the highest clearance that you can get in the government. Yeah. And I was terrified. I was terrified of publishing the book because not only do I talk shit about the government, but I was disclosing all this in an area in Houston where it's very prevalent of drug dealing and cartel. But then I thought to myself, the cartel gains nothing by killing me. The thing about it, I'm not going out in public and talking about specific names or specific plans or specific movements. I'm not really identifying anybody from the cartel. I'm just saying I ended up marrying into the cartel. And so a lot of people thought I was gonna end up dead in a ditch but I said, if you're logical and you have understanding of how the cartel works, if the, if the cartel kills me, I'm going to be plastered on CNN, ex-agent dead in a ditch. That's too much noise for the cartel. The cartel doesn't need attention or noise. Because remember, the cartel tries to stay undercover and tries to stay in the darkness. That's why you never see these cartel members. You never see Chapo with a Lambo or fancy cars. The, the guy's wearing like jeans and a t-shirt and eating tacos, you know? And I think a lot of people get brainwashed in what they see in the, in the media and in the movies that they think that it's this whole flashy, dashy, you know, type of world and it, it's not. Yeah, it's the fake life, and it? it's the f glorifying the fake life. But they put right. some of these films, the fancy cars and the fancy women and all the jewelry. But that just makes people think that's what I want to go and get it, and it just draws red flags for people yeah. to then target. People, right? People are so silly, man. I had right. an old drug lord on from Liverpool just last week. He bought a white Rolls Royce. He says it was his biggest ever mistake because it just draws so much. Attention. It draws attention. <clears throat> it draws attention. And the crazy thing is, I have a story in my book about. The elote lady. So this is a lady who has a little cart that's selling corn outside of the grocery store in Houston. This little woman is selling corn outside of the, of the grocery store. Then she goes around, leaves the little cart and gets in an Escalade. So it's like, it's like, you know, when people have money, they want to be so flashy. But then when you get to a level that you're making it, you don't want to be flashy. And then all of a sudden now you want to not look like you have money because it draws attention. Mm -hmm. So when you're a, a cartel member, you do not want to draw attention. What ship are you talking about the government and your book? Oh, um, I was talking about Trump. Uh, I talked about Trump in the book and I talked about the corruption in, in, in the government. I went in the government. I went in the government to work. I really wanted to make a difference. I really wanted to understand why these crazy fucks do what they do. And I ended up seeing a whole different side. Um, it's nepotism. Whoever likes you the most, it, it's a popularity contest and everybody's doing corrupt things. You know, I, I talked about Trump in the book, how all these people rushed into this government building. Like that was planned. Uh, you know how hard it is to get into government buildings? It's very hard. There's people on the roof with guns. So for all these people to just rush in one day and nobody knew that this was going to happen is, I think it's a bunch of bullshit. Is like, that actors? Yeah, no, it, it was actually people. It was, it, it was. Because all, I seen the guy with like the. Yeah, no, they were actors. Hat. They, they, they were support, Trump supporters and, you know, shit like that doesn't just happen. You know, because even me, I have access to these buildings and even people who have access to these buildings 
this it's not that easy. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, I tell people, guys, you guys are so stupid. Like this was orchestrated. This was planned. You know, just like 9-11 and all this other stuff, stuff was planned. It just doesn't happen. This was planned and orchestrated. And, you know, it's crazy. You see all these people hanging off of government buildings and doing this crazy madness. And, and people say, oh, it just happened. No, it didn't just happen. The UK is in a bit of, of a mess just now. What's America like? In regards to... Just life. I think... I think we have a lot of problems with the economy. Obviously, we're, we're going through a recession. And there, obviously, there's a lot of debt. Uh, there's a lot of crime. I think, you know, just like the gentleman was talking about, there's a lot of crime that goes unspoken of, especially with, with drugs, with uh, the rise in cocaine addiction. And obviously, now it's like the, it's becoming harder to sustain a certain type of lifestyle and so that just causes more crime. So, and I mean, let's not even talk about mental health and depression because there's more suicides, there's more killings, all of that is all up on the rise. It's sad though, isn't it? I think it's just everywhere in the world and the fucking sad things, the world doesn't need to be like that. It doesn't need to be full of greed and envy and poison and bad foods and toxins and right. pollution and whatever it is that's destroying people. I don't know, man, if we'll ever see a better world in our lifetime and that's sad to think because only needs to people make a stand to then create better change but i think people are just so caught up in pain they can't free think anymore yeah i think yeah i mean it, it's a fucked up world and and i don't think it's going to get any better it's just going to keep getting worse and, and and i hate to say this but it's like like covid right mm -hmm. strongest of the the strongest <clears throat> will survive what about what's the worst thing you've seen being an, uh, an investigator? The worst thing that I've seen has been, I would say the human trafficking, how children are being used as money and they're transferable and they're being used. I mean, it's like cattle. It's like, I'll give you five if you give me this. I think that's the saddest thing is that now children have become currency. How about that as a mother? It's horrible. Kids? It's absolutely horrible. In fact, I sometimes don't even take my own kids to the grocery store because that's how bad it is in Houston. Kids are just being taken and, st and, and stolen off of carts. So, How's life been since the book's been released? It's been great. I have to say, the worst thing that happened to me was the best thing that happened to me because what I didn't do with him in 10 years, I did on my own in three years. Like I became a bestseller, I got published on Forbes, and then now I signed the movie with Hollywood. And I was named the executive producer. And I now have people that are wanting to buy my intellectual property for book two. So it's crazy. It's like I was on the floor crying. My life was over. And then it just took a turn. What happens with your kids? Do they ever get to see their yeah, dad? They see them. It, it's it's all very strategically done. Obviously, it's, you know, there's, it's it's all enforced. So, yeah. And surprisingly, we, we actually have a better relationship now than we did before. So, but if you were to ask him about the book, he denies, 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 denies. He's like, it's all a lie. It's not true. So that's, that's the story he goes with. Do you think it's because there's no bullshit anymore? No lies, no deceit? Where, yeah. Because holding lies and deceit, it does something to your energy. You know how if you know someone's off, if they've done something, you think, mm, you're yeah. off today, what's up? Oh, nothing, 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 nothing. Yeah. You, you know? It because, drains your energy. You're right. Yeah. It drains your soul for sure. Mm -hmm. It's mad though, like, for you to be doing that job, interrogating people to then being tricked, lied to, fooled. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, Yeah. It it's literally the worst thing that I, I can never even put it into words or even think of it. Like, my worst enemy should never go through that. Do you think he was learning tactics from you? How to interrogate, how to... I don't think he was. I think that his involvement, because he was a child, right? I think mm -hmm. his involvement was strictly monetary. I think he was really good with money. So I think with him, it was just the moving of the money that mm -hmm. he was doing. But I mean, he told me when he was in high school, he was a runner. He was moving drugs in his little high school car. He would go to baseball practice and then he would go drop drugs off. See, when you're interrogating people, do you get taught what to look for, telltale signs, fidgeting, twitching, and right. eye contact? Do you... Do you get taught all that? Yeah. 
we get taught all that, but everything that we learn, you you kind of learn through experience and you learn what works for you best. Any high profile names? That I can say no. Ah, <laughs> I mean, I already did say, I, I did mm. mention Chapo, you know, and, and, and again, one thing that I did learn that I could say is people think that these people are sitting in a penitentiary and most of them are on, in orange farms. Like they don't put them in the penitentiaries. They take them to a remote location, but the remote location is never is never disclosed to the media. And everybody thinks that these big drug lords are sitting in, in the federal penitentiaries. They're not. What's the death penalty like? A lot of them don't get the death penalty because what? they're too valuable. They're too valuable to the entire organization and they're too valuable to entire investigation. Mm -hmm. So if they end up dead, it's because somebody ordered them to be killed. You know, just like Weinstein. But, yeah. See these, let's, do you have to do psychiatric reports on these people as well? I don't, no. They're called mental health assessments, but I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't do that. For me, most, most of my interrogations were trying to almost, the way that I explain it is trying to interrogate a child. And how do you interrogate a child is you talk to somebody, you talk to their inner child. Mm -hmm. Because that's where it all stems from, is the child in them. Did any of them ever break down? All the time. Okay. All the time. Yeah. Yeah, you think these guys are out here killing and slicing people, but they're they're just they're just pussies. <laughs> yeah, scared. <laughs> yeah, they're scared. And I think when you press their buttons, they become children. They turn into children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that was probably the best tactic was when you hit a nerve of their childhood, that's when they break down because then they start realizing where all this started from or where it stemmed from. And it was usually the bullying or the rape or the molestation from a parent or a loved one because they felt that they weren't taken care of. And to be part of a bigger organization where they feel they're being taken care of or they're a part of something bigger feels better to them than to not be wanted. Do you see a lot of the ones who were abused as kids then become abusers themselves? Oh, all the towards time. kids? All the time. You know, you hear about this all the time. You have these corporation owners, CEOs, business guys who are having sex with minors and having ch sex with children. And it's because they were raped as children. So this is what they know. A lot of them always have those tendencies. It's fucking weird though. It's, fuck, it's crazy. Have you watched that show To Catch a Predator? Yeah. Where the kids, you know, the, the adults act like kids mm -hmm. and then the, they show up to the house to have sex with them. And then the guy comes out, hey, what's up? And it's like CEOs, pastors, you know, church, church, uh, heads of churches. Don't you think, though, they should be doing polygraph tests with people who work with kids? I think so. But the problem is it costs a lot of money. Yeah. It costs a lot of money. The equipment is expensive. Uh, the trained individual has to be there. So even if, I mean, think about all these teachers that get caught having sex with these kids. Can you imagine how much money the state would have to pay to get these polygraphs done? But even if you do a polygraph center in every city, it shouldn't be that. And if you're going to work with kids or work on a soccer team or working Cub anything. Scouts, anything to do with kids. Listen, if you're a fucking predator, you're going to do stuff to be near kids. So it's prime target. So all you need to do is come in for the test. Okay, listen, you failed, but it's, we'll keep it discreet. Um, yeah, you just can't work with kids. And start. It's crazy. I mean, they do they do basic background investigations, but a basic background investigation just is going to show how many tickets you got driving, or if you have any criminal charges. But they don't do any psychologicals on you to see if you're really messed up in the head. Because in the UK, they can change their name here for less than twenty pounds. So oh, they yeah, get, they get a new identity, and that's where they can move away and do the, the creepy shit as well. What's the rule? What's the because it, it's the the court system here and it, it's a joke for paedophiles. It's a joke for sex really? cases. It's community service. It's a wow. year prison, two year prison. What in America do they chemically castrate? Is this correct? In America, it's rough. If you <clears throat> if you get put on the sex offender list, you can't get a job. You can't get a house. You can't get an apartment because you got to go on this on this database. Mm -hmm. So even if you got caught, let's say you were uh, eighteen and she was 16, you can get charged with child molestation or um, like rape, you know? And you get put on this list. 
And you can go online and see how many sex offenders live near your house. Like there's a whole database. You're like, oh, so-and-so lives here. And then you can't live like two miles from schools a schools or daycares and stuff like that. It's crazy. It really that's the is. way it should be. That's how it is. So if you get put on that data and that database and it's public, you can go on there and just look it up. Nobody yeah. will hire you. But that's the way it fucking that's should it, be. That's Here, the way it like should be. Like I say, you can change your name. Yeah. Change your name. If a less than 20, <laughs> new identity and, and there's been so many young girls being murdered by people who've changed their name and then moved away and then they've changed their identity. So yeah. there needs to be more protection for kids. The law I in agree. the UK for this is an absolute fucking joke. It's an absolute joke. I agree. How, so when's the film? Talk about the film. So what's the plan? So the film is called Veritas. It's, uh, it's called what? Veritas, what's which that? means uh, Veritas means the truth in Latin. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be produced by uh, Gold Tree Films. That's who I signed with. And so, you know, there was a writer's strike and a, a actor strike. Yeah, so the writer's year. strike, well, it, it's been going on for eight months yeah. now, six months. And so the writers finally agreed because now my writers can actually write because our writers were not able to write the script to my movie. So now we're back in, in action again. So I got named executive producer. So I'm involved in everything, the creative process, the actors, the script, everything down to the production. So I'll have hands on it. So, so see when your book comes out and then you start doing talks and did anybody ever come forward to you interrogated to message you to say, you fuck No, up? not at all. Not no at one. all. And you know what it is? <clears throat> I think the cartel feels sorry for me. And th I tell this to people. I think they feel sorry for me because they knew what I didn't know. And I almost feel like a lot of these cartel members love talking to me because for once in their life, they actually felt heard. And I tell this in interviews all the time. I was not seen as a threat because I was collecting information from people who were ready to talk. All my guys were always ready to talk because they were trying to make a deal with the government. What was your own family saying? Oh my God, my poor family. My dad and my mom were probably, I, I describe it as frozen in time. Whenever I told my father, I felt like he just, his, his face just turned white. Because he's like, how the fuck did this happen? Like, literally. He has not spoken to him in three years. That's how he doesn't respect them at all. He 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 could not believe it. It's like, in what world does this happen? Yeah, it is kind of movie like, but I not. I mean, it sounds like a movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> and how's life now? Life is good. Life is really good. As you see, I'm traveling and working mm -hmm. on second book. And now I've, you know, I've. I got put on two documentaries because I'm now I'm an executive producer. I'm a motivational speaker. Forbes just published me. I'm about to go on TED Talk. So it's been like a whole 180. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for me to talk about it now. And I think a lot of women see me as an inspiration because I lost everything. I literally left this lavish lifestyle with my kids. But the, the smart thing about me was having him sign that authorization because when he signed that authorization, he was pretty much giving me permission to talk about this entire story. And any project that came off of that story, they cannot touch it, monetarily wise. So how did you pick the pieces up then? I just had <clears throat> to. As a mother, you just have to be strong for your kids. Instinct. Instinct, yeah. You know, like the lioness, when somebody's trying to mess with their cubs, yeah. they turn into something they're not. Just like you said, if you need to kill, you will kill. So you're, you could carry a gun and shit as well? Yeah, I carry a gun. I love that shit. Yeah. It was so me. funny. I was just talking to my friend and <laughs> says, like, here you can't even carry a knife in your car. No, you can't carry You know, and in, in, it's crazy. But yeah. you know, in Texas, everyone has guns. Everybody has guns. Even the old little ladies have them in their little bags. Why is that? The, the laws. And can anybody get a gun? Anybody can get a gun. You can go to Walmart and get a gun. You can go to the corner store and get a gun. A BB gun, a taser, a all types of guns. Silencer, silencers are not illegal. You can get a silencer and kill somebody. Nobody hears it. And what about licenses? You, you, you can get a license to carry. And the process is very simple. As long as you're, you're not a felon, you get a gun. But it's very accessible to get guns. I mean, even if you don't have a license, you can just go and get a gun. Somebody can buy you a gun for you. And what if you get caught with a gun with no license? Then obviously you can go to jail for it, but they oh. have to stop you for a reason. 
so they can't just pull you. Uh, you can't no, just they can't just pull you over. over. I know. I was just talking to my friend. Like you, they they have to have reason to pull you over. And then, in fact, people in the U.S. need to know their laws. Like they have to have probable cause to go through your car because technically your car is your private property. So when they say, "Sir, step out of the car," you don't have to if you don't want to. You okay to just say you're acting suspicious, right? Yeah, and they just fucking say out shit. A lot yeah. of people. And you know now drugs are <clears throat> well, marijuana is legal in some states and not legal in others. Mm -hmm. So all these people that are in jail for these uh, drug-related crimes, marijuana crimes, are sitting in jail, and now everybody's trying to get them out of prison. Mm -hmm. So, because now you can smoke marijuana in Illinois, California. There's all these different states. How busy is the prison system in America? Is it overpopulated, as they say? Let me tell you. Not only is it overpopulated, these motherfuckers are getting PhDs in school, or in, in, in prison. You have a place to live, a place to eat, a place to have free education. It's like being glamorized to be in jail. There's people in jail making millions of dollars, doing online businesses and whatnot. And you know why? Because all you have is time. And you have all these resources. There's people coming out of prison with PhDs and lawyer degrees because all you have is time. It's crazy. But you know, in Texas, we're still killing people because there's certain states where the death penalty is still active and some states where it's been abolished. Texas, we're killing them left and right. How many people? I think they say, I say about 30 people get killed in, in the state of Texas uh, a day. It's probably more. So Huntsville is probably two hours north of where I live. And they probably kill the most there. Because it's still, the death penalty is still alive in, in Texas. Why do the Americans give sentences like 180 years and 140 years? What is the meaning behind stupid. that? There is no <clears throat> meaning. It, it really, to be honest with you, it's, it's just for paperwork. So that, and really for the family. You're not going to live 100 years. All you have to say is life in prison. But it's paperwork. For me, it's paperwork. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy that killed my friend. He was supposed to be dead right now. But in 2006, the governor of Illinois abolished the death penalty. So he's sitting on death row forever until he dies in prison. Never get out. Never gets out. What about, but he was supposed to be dead. What about people who are innocent, wrongly convicted? How bad is that in America? I would say it's, it's, it's bad, right? And I would say it, it definitely goes with the people of color, minorities. Because it's easier to throw something on a minority than it is to a white person, in my opinion. But it's there's still instances out there where people are wrongfully accused. But I think somebody needs to be accused and somebody needs to take the fall for a violent crime. So as long as somebody takes the fall, then things are okay. But it's not okay for the person that didn't do it. How bad is racism in America? I would say it's really bad. It's really bad because crime has gone up. Drug dealing has gone up. Human trafficking has gone up. When things around us get bad, people's vices and addictions get worse. And so drug trafficking, human trafficking, and murders and all that is, is an all-time high, including suicides. Because it's becoming harder to sustain the lifestyle that we had before. Is there much suicides in prison in America? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How many gangs are in these prisons? Oh, my goodness. I think the question is, who's not in the, in mm -hmm. what gangs are not in? I think gangs, gangs have so much power and, you know, it's organized crime. And I, people don't realize that, oh, they think this little small gang is just in the corners. No, these are big organized entities. It's like New World Mafia. Call it a gang, call it mafia, but it's organized crime. It's in the prison, outside the prison. They're all interconnected. It's fucked up, isn't it, though? It's really fucked up. Because, like I said, UK is pretty fucked up, but only thing here, we don't have guns. We have guns, but you you very rare, rarely see or hear someone getting shot. <clears throat> oh, over there. I mean, think about it. All those school shootings. It's crazy. It's crazy how so many school shootings are happening, but yet they don't have guns in the school system. Like the teachers should have, I think the teachers should have guns. Security? The security doesn't have guns. Some, sometimes they're just little rent-a-cops without any guns. They're just running around. Did you ever interrogate a school shooter? 
I did. <clears throat> I did. I interrogated a young one that was uh, considered a terrorist. And most of the time, like we go back to, is being bullied, being uh, called certain names, being disrespected, feeling like they weren't part of something. And the reason why they do these huge mass murders is so that they can go down in history. Bad attention is attention in any way or form. So even if you're getting bad attention, you're still getting attention. And what it is, is attention seeking. All these kids want attention. And it, if it means killing other kids, they're going to do it. Does computer games come into play with these people's mindsets? Because I think I know so. They used to talk about it and I thought, mm, I don't know. But again, you, is it a part of your playing computer games that's killing people and beating people up and blowing people up? Do you yep. think that can play an effect For on people's sure. mindset? For sure, because think about it. If you go in there and you're doing this digitally, all of this is processing through your brain. I mean, you even, I don't know if you've ever played a game like that, but yeah. when you stop, you're kind of like, ooh, you're kind of mm. shaky a little bit and, you know, because you were doing all this stuff. I think so. I think it, it gives them a grandiose feeling like, well, if I could do it here, I could do it out there for sure. What was the terrorists like? The terrorists, I think, are probably the most interesting. I describe there's five different types of terrorists in my book. But that was probably the biggest understanding that I understood because they talk about um, my first terrorist who was Muslim said to me, when people commit suicide, it's out of pain. When we commit suicide, it's out of victory. And it blew my mind because when they kill other people and then commit a you know, suicide bomber, they're doing it with honor. And that's the difference. The difference was they weren't mentally in pain. They were getting honor. It's crazy though, isn't it? It's fucking crazy. It really is. Yeah. Fucking hell, America is just as bad as the UK, man. If not, Americans are, like I say, with the serial killers and that, these are proper. Some of them are fucking crazy, man. Right. They're very crazy. And you know and what Why are they so popular, though? Like, what, Netflix documentaries and... Do you think that can then people look up to these fucking crazy people? I think so. Yeah, because it all starts in the streets. You know, like drug dealing starts in the streets. First, you start with smaller drugs. You know, you start with like marijuana and then you move up to cocaine. Now, the shit that's being sold in the streets, the DEA has its own its own uh, section called the diversion section where it's pharmaceuticals now. There's drugs out there that are being made in tubs in China that will kill you if you take it. And they put all types of shit in it so that you really trip and you really go crazy. And now, of course, there's shrooms, you know, the magic shrooms, which are hallucinogens. Drugs are never, ever going to, we are always going to have a drug problem because there's always people with addiction and it's money involved and everybody has a price. Yeah, because humans are in pain. We've got spice here, which was fucking legal, but it's it fucks people up. They look like zombies. Yeah. They look like zombies and... <clears throat> I think as humans, we're experiment hunters and we're always try something, especially if you're looking for guidance or something to take away the pain. As long as there's addiction, it drug drugs stimulate the U.S. economy. As much as people say, oh, the DEA, we're this war on drugs. No, it's never going to go away. There's always going to be a, a war on drugs as long as there's people addicted and as long there's money involved. How bad is homelessness in America? It's bad. It's really bad. I know, I don't know if you've noticed, but California is probably the worst. There's whole cities with homeless. They started making little houses for the homeless out of uh, trash cans. Like little, yeah. Because I was in LA. It's really bad. Oh, LA is the back, worst. And they used to like, pick people up from certain cities and then drop them off in LA. Crazy. Well, you know what's happening now is... All the illegal immigrants that are coming into the U.S., they put them in cars and they just drop them off wherever. So now you have busloads of immigrants that are just being dumped in, you know, New York, Houston, San Antonio, San Diego. They just dump them out there. 
let's touch on the second book. Can you say much about that yet? I know you're still writing it, but when can when's it coming out? And the, the book, second book? And is it going to be a follow up to the first book? Yes. So second book is called The Power of Forgiveness. And it's a continuation of book one. It starts with my federal investigation. I went on there for seven weeks. And the power of forgiveness now has turned into my signature TED Talk speech because I needed to forgive my ex in order to recreate myself and really move on with my life. So it's in the works, it's coming, and there will be a sequel to the movie. The movie, we are now going into production. So the movie should be done sometime next year. And it will be a big feature film. So I'm excited. Good on you. How important is forgiveness? I think it's the most important because if you don't forgive yourself, you can never forgive anybody that's done you wrong. And how was it going and speaking in stages and doing talks and motivational speaking? What sort of motivational stuff are you doing? So right now I do uh, women empowerment, obviously mental health, and then I do minority based. But really the biggest thing is trauma and how I've literally turned trauma into resilience. And I turned my entire life around and, and I now I gained all this newfound knowledge of all these industries. Um, who would have thought three years ago if somebody said to me, you're going to be in Forbes or you're going to be an executive producer, I would have laughed. But really is to teach women that even when the worst happens to you, you can still pick up and recreate yourself. Why Why do you think men struggle more than women? Why do you think suicide rates higher in men than as women? I think men are taught to be physically strong and emotionally weak. You cannot share your emotions because if you do, you're considered weak. And so what you do is you harbor a lot of emotions and it's hard. It's hard being a man because you're taught that you have to be strong and men don't cry. So I think, you know, you break down. A lot of men break down and they just can't handle it. See the people you interrogated, did any of them ever change? Did you ever see changes in them where they started to see the world and how fucked up they were? Yeah. I definitely think so, because at the end of the day, a lot of them were just doing it for money, right? And then they just get lost, and sometimes you're in too deep. And once you're in too deep, there's no going back. So, yeah, I, I think if we're talking about rehabilitation, definitely. And a lot of these people don't want to do what they're doing. They just got involved in it, and the money was good. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you always say, like, whenever you're trying to leave a gang— it's very difficult to leave. Sometimes with the cartel too, there's only two ways out of the cartel. One, you die, or two, you become part of witness protection program. Is there a lot of snitches in America? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's weak men mentality though. If you're in the game, man, you've got to stay strong. And But again, people are too weak. They can't do the fucking Yeah, I think a lot of people just don't know how to process and they don't know how to deal with shit. And, you know, we're not taught to deal with it. A lot of people are, they don't want to talk about their emotions. And I think that's one of the things that has helped me a lot is I keep talking and talking and talking about it to the point where I laugh now. Now I laugh and I'm like, wow, I thought I was this big world-class interrogator and look what happened to me. <laughs> and I laugh about it now because I'm like, wow, I thought I was hot shit. And look at this. I married, I married into the cartel <laughs> as an agent and I didn't even uh, see it. It's funny, man, because anybody can be fucked over. Yeah. No matter how intelligent, how smart you think you are. I know there's men out there. Ah, my girlfriend would never cheat. Or there's men right. who think they're strong in us. <laughs> They're getting the wheel pulled over their eyes because everybody's got it. And if you're deviant enough and weird enough, people can pull the wheel over. Because I've had my, I'm, I don't really trust as much. I'm learning as I got older to trust a bit more. But there's people you think, nah. And then they're the ones you never thought it would they come turn. from, man. Yeah, the fuckers. But everything's a lesson in life. It's either a lesson or a blessing. All we can do is just... Like you say, laughter's the best medicine to think, you know what, I was in the past, I was fucked over, I got done. But at least they became honest. You've got to respect that as well. They actually opened up. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the crazy thing is uh, how, and, you know, I still think about it, how did this happen, right, one? And then two, I'm like, wow, this is a really good fucking story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really is. And I get to tell the story and... I, I do have a worry, and I, and I say this in all the interviews that I do with my children, because they're getting older and they're going to read the book, and then now they're going to have to deal with, with the, what their father did. 
And I, I have my kids in therapy. You know, even the therapist of my children read the book and she pulled me aside and was like, holy fuck. And I was like, I know. And she's like, wow. She's like, we got a lot of work to do. And I said, yeah, because these kids are going to grow up and they're going to have questions to their father. Why? Like, why did you do this? Not only to me, but to them. Like, did you? And then I'm sure he's going to say something around the lines of, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking about her, about you guys. But you can understand that because men don't really think either. <laughs> right. we, we, we don't really fucking think. We just <laughs> think of what we can get at that present moment sometimes. Right. He's probably not thinking about the damage it would have on his kids. He genuinely probably isn't because right. how long could they have kept that mask on for? Right. The rest of his life. Right. Do you know what I mean? So maybe it's hit him. Maybe he's new for a few years and the book's been his excuse to then drop the bomb. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Because I would have been thinking about it in my own opinion as a man. Yeah. But sometimes men, we do, don't really think about the long-term effects of your actions sometimes, you know? So it's possibly that he wasn't thinking, even though, listen, right. you still have a conscience choice. We get it, right. but he's probably went through and thought, fuck sake, man, I'm in deep now. And he's probably thought about telling you many times, Many times, right. And I think that's just been, this is my time now. Right. And you know what? This is crazy, but I always think about this. He held this for so long. If I never, if COVID never happened and I was never approached to write the book, he would have never told me. So even if the book never sold and I still wrote the book, it made a difference in my own household. Would you have been happy just in that life? No, because we our our relationship was already fucked. Was already fucked. Yeah. In fact, we were in therapy and the therapist said out loud, I didn't, but the therapist said, You're lying. You're holding something back. What is it? So the therapist was putting fire under his ass. So I think that and the book coming out, he had no choice. Like his conscience was literally just eating away at him. So even that therapy was lying? No. It's crazy. Fucked up. Where do yeah. you go forward for the future? You know, I, I'm excited for the future. There's so much going on. And now I'm being put on other projects. You know, who would have thought? Now I'm an executive producer. I got put on two other documentaries. And so now I get to do a whole different life. And, you know, my children are well. The book is doing well. And, and I love speaking. I love speaking. And it was something that I never thought I would do. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, no matter if you feel your life is over, you get a chance to recreate yourself. Because I've been through hell and back. And here I am. It's weird, isn't it? Because they always say when one door closes, another one opens. That is a true saying. Yes. So when people think there's no end, sometimes that lesson that you're going through or that thing that you're going through, other things happen. And it's down to you to follow through and try and make it as positive as you can. Right. But Life is life. It's never going to be fucking perfect. We can never figure it out. And all we can do is kind of get on with it. Where can people buy your book? So Amazon and Audible and then Barnes and Nobles and any, and really any store online. Mm -hmm. But Amazon is the easiest way to find it. For anybody that's watching that's maybe battling some trauma just now or have been for 10, 20, 30 years, you know what trauma's like. It's always there. What advice would you have for them to try and face the trauma and overcome it? Yeah, I would say process it. Talk to somebody. If therapy is your thing, talk to somebody that can hear you out. But I think a lot of people dealing with trauma need to be heard. It needs to come out of your brain and out into the open. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be processed and, and dealt with. If not, it's just going to continue to kill you slowly but surely. Angelica, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, it was great. Thank you for having yeah, me. Listen, thanks for coming on. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank like you. Like I say, if you're looking for any actors yes. for your movie, <laughs> just give me a shout. The Scottish Mexican will be there. All right. Yeah, God bless you. And thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>